So, um, Isaac, thank you very much, and thanks very much for the opportunity to be here and participate in this simulation. I found this to be a very, very useful, interesting, um, informative presentation. And uh, obviously, it's a critical time for Israel, given all that's going on in the world, and also uh, an important time in the uh, long uh, history of U.S.-Israeli relations. So I'm not representing the United States in any official sense. I don't have any instructions from the White House. Nobody told me to bring a message to the Prime Minister. It's just, uh, I'm just here as a retired general officer and someone who knows the American defense establishment and a little about cybersecurity to give you an American perspective in the game. I've been to Israel many times. I came here the first time in 1976 when I was a major and I was working in the White House. I was back in 88. I saw um, uh, General Tal in 1988 or 89 and we looked at tank design and we've looked at the strategic situation many times. I worked with um, Israel when I was in the Joint Staff and as the NATO commander and U.S. European Command commander, I actually brought a couple of Patriot missile batteries here in the fall of 1998 before the United States executed a strike on uh, Iraq. So uh, I've got a long familiarity. I've got a lot of Israeli friends and business associates. And um, my father was Jewish, so this is a country that's near and dear to my heart. So with that, then let me just say that um, here's the things that I took out of this. First of all, you saw the scenario. The number one problem is that you couldn't tell for sure where the cyber attack came from. It certainly came from someone who was hostile, but did it come from Hezbollah or did it come from a state? And if it came from a state, was it Iran or was Iran assisted by other states' parties? We never got to the bottom of that. Cyber can have cyber effects. It can shut down communications. It can close off an embassy disrupt the ability to fly airplanes and so forth, but it can also have the effects that are comparable to a kinetic strike. You can cause machinery to blow up and transformers to fail and other things, and so you can do lasting material damage with cyber. How you distinguish the cause and then how you limit the effects, those are really important problems that have to be worked. Um, they have to be worked in advance by governments. This is not something that you can wait for the actual scenario and say, let's call all the experts in. If you look at the United States right now, and I'm sorry to acknowledge this internationally, it probably doesn't seem like a big thing to you in Israel, but we tried to implement our Affordable Care Act for national health insurance on the 1st of October. And this is now the middle of November. And we've supposedly called in the best technical experts, and apparently it's not fixed yet. And I, I say this because this is a, when you get into software and code and, and, and lots of databases and things, it becomes very, very complicated. And uh, everybody knows that in terms of aircraft design, for example, the last piece to be finished is always the software for the aircraft. And if you can build an aircraft that doesn't have complicated software, you can build it much faster. So a famed aircraft designer, Bert Rutan, he always likes to put a man in the loop because he doesn't want to do software design. It's so complicated and so difficult. And that's the heart of what the cyber problem is. So lots of preparation. Part of that preparation has to be a really careful assessment of your potential adversaries' capabilities. So you can't wait to detect footprints of the cyber attack. You've got to know in advance who has the capacity, who's been practicing this against you. You've got to also, in advance, prepare your, let's call it, standards of evidence. In a legal proceeding, generally you have to have beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what does it take to launch a required or response on a cyber attack? Is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Can there be any doubt whatsoever? Is it beyond unreasonable doubt? 
Is it absolute smoking gun proof? Must you have your hands on the individual who actually pushed the sin button on the virus and have his passport and then tie him to the national government with an intent to commit? Or is it simply enough to know that there's an IP address in a certain country and you think that country has, has a motive to exploit? These are issues that actually need to be discussed in advance through simulations just like this with the highest levels of government. Because in the heat of the moment, it's very difficult to suddenly construct a set of decision-making rules on what's the right standard for attack. If a missile comes from territory, you know pretty much who it came from and you can respond. Cyber attack is much more ambiguous, it's deniable, and you need to have thought through in advance. You also need to do preparation with partners. So uh, if you have allies, then you need to be disclosing enough about what you might do to be able to determine whether your allies can complement or reinforce or simply are in the dark. And this is a little difficult to do because cyber capacities are the most sensitive and closely guarded secrets of government. They just don't like to disclose them because when you disclose the cyber capacities, you get close to the equivalent of the National Security Agency. And we know that only the United States listens in on other people's conversations, right? So I'm sure, you know, nobody in Israel has that capacity. But so what I'm saying is that if everything starts like this scenario started and it's de novo, it's completely the first time and there's been no advanced preparation, you're not going to have very good support from your friends and allies around the world. Now, on the, uh, one more point on the cyber. Defensive is more important than offensive. Why? Because defensive gives you time to respond and pick your targets, whether they're kinetic or cyber. If you don't have the defensive, then the time pressure and the worry about the second wave becomes overwhelming. You know, the first attack that comes and the electricity goes down in New York City, that's happened before. There have been rolling blackouts in California. That's happened before. But if, it, if you've got a great cyber defensive system, you say it's not going to happen again, everybody's alert, blah, 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 they've gone through all this. Fine. Then you say, okay, let's relax, let's pick our target. If you don't have that cyber defense in place, then you're continuously vulnerable and you're going to be pressured to make decisions and respond earlier than you might want to. So you cannot neglect the defensive. The defensive must include all of the civilian businesses and infrastructure. It has to include the hospitals, the power system, the sewage, the water, all the utilities. It has to include airports and transportation nodes. Everything that's connected on that internet is vulnerable to cyber attack and since it's all part of your economic system, the banks, if something gets shut down, you can't go to an automatic teller machine and draw money, what are you going to do? What happens then when the credit card system fails? So you don't want any single piece of the economy to be vulnerable. So that means in peacetime, the whole economy has to know how to be on a war footing. Maybe that's, maybe that's ordinary in Israel. Maybe that's easy in Israel. It certainly isn't easy in the United States. We haven't succeeded in doing it. We know we're vulnerable. And, um, and that's part of our problem. So, uh, but I, I just want to be sure that we emphasize the defensive as well as the offensive. The strategic situation portrayed in the scenario was also pretty interesting. First of all, one of the interesting things is that if an adversary mixes cyber attack with kinetic attack, he's lost the key advantage of the cyber attack, which is it's deniable. He's given himself away. So, why would he do that? It might, he might think it would reinforce the power of the attack, but in fact he loses his greatest single advantage. So the greater threat is a deniable cyber attack 
that's not keyed to any kinetic attack. In fact, it's not even seen as an attack. It looks like a systemic failure within a country. That's the greatest threat. So the more it's tied to a, a, a hypothetical predicted strategic situation, the easier it is to work against it. The Mideast is changing. In 1991, Under Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz was in his office one afternoon in May, and I was a one-star general <laughs> commanding the National Training Center out in the Mojave Desert in California, and I happened to be in the Pentagon, and I went to see Under Secretary Wolfowitz. Our troops were coming back from the Gulf War. For the United States, it had been a magnificent victory. There was talk that there was going to be a hero's parade for General Schwarzkopf down Constitution Avenue. In Israel, there was some sober accounting done on whether or not the Patriot missiles actually struck the Scud missiles and did any damage to them or not. And Israel wasn't in the celebratory mood that Washington was in, but Washington was. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon in May, and I went in to see Under Secretary Wolfowitz just to say hello. And I said, Mr. Secretary, you must be proud of the work that the American forces did in the Gulf War. He said, yes, but he said, we didn't get Saddam Hussein. He said, uh, he said President Bush, this is George H. Bush, Bush 41, um, he said, President Bush thinks he's going to be overthrown by his own people. At the time, the Marsh Arabs were in revolt. He said, but he says, I don't think that's going to happen. And he said, it was a mistake. He said, but we did learn one thing. He said, we learned that we can intervene militarily and the Soviets won't do a thing to stop us. He said, we've got five to ten years to clean up these old Soviet surrogate states in the Mideast before the next superpower comes along to stop us. Well, I was kind of taken aback because this didn't sound like the United States of America that I knew. I, I grew up in the Cold War United States where General Curtis LeMay and the Strategic Air Command had a patch that said, peace is our profession, and we tried to prevent war, not wage it. The Israeli Defense Forces, you were different. You waged war. And there were a lot of people in the United States, including Paul Wolfowitz, who were greatly in admiration of Israel's armed forces, but not the Americans. I mean, we didn't do that sort of thing. And what Paul Wolfowitz was saying struck me as very odd. And yet he was exactly right. We went into the Middle East in 2003. We didn't have any resistance from the Russians. None. Now the Russians are in Syria. What we saw in this situation is the glimmer of the future. So there are outside powers back in the region. So it's not any longer a simple situation of Israel having to persuade the United States, hey, come and help us and keep everybody out. And the United States simply saying, hey, yeah, leave our friends the Israelis alone. Let them do what they have to do. Now it's a little more complicated because we have major powers in here who also have interests who also may have capacities to affect us. This brings me to my third point on the strategic situation. There is an arms race underway in the Mideast. It's been underway for a long, long time. In the 1940s and 50s, Israel, as you know better than I, got by on unsophisticated, old military hardware with outstanding leadership and, and technical skills. So your pilots could fly old A-4 Skyhawks and beat the best stuff that the Russians had given to the other side. I was, when I was here in 1976, General Billy, Benny Pellet said to me at an air base, sitting at lunch, he said, when we get the F-15 and F-16, he said, we will rule the Eastern Mediterranean. And he wasn't kidding. And in 1982, Israel proved it, and you defeated the best of Soviet technology. That really banished the Russian influence in the region. But they haven't stopped developing their technology. The SA-300 or 400, which is the export version of this, um, is in, in play in the region. Is it actually here? 
or advanced components of it in Syria? Has any part of it been deployed to Iran? What is its capacity? We actually haven't seen it in action. But we know it's a, it's a um, very complicated, very modern radar, electronically steered beam. We know it handles multiple targets. We know the missiles are much faster and more energetic than any existing Russian missiles, more maneuverable. It has an anti-ballistic missile capacity that's at least as good as what we believe the Patriots have. And that's coupled with another Russian system, which we do believe is in Syria, which NATO has called the SS-26 missile, which is a hypersonic, non-ballistic, 150 mile or kilometer range um, surface to surface missile that could strike at Patriot batteries and because it's non-ballistic it doesn't meet the computational norms of most anti-aircraft or anti-ballistic missile systems because it has to be met by a steerable warhead which can predict its terminal guidance. So it's a pretty challenging technical problem. So there's an arms race going on and uh, we haven't won that arms race yet. I say we. The United States hasn't deployed against it, and Israel, in this respect, is both its own defense developer, but also using U.S. capacities. So you haven't beaten it either. Until that's beaten, there will remain a strategic arms race question mark. Finally, Hezbollah versus the Iranian nuclear capacity. One of the odd things that the scenario showed was that although it was a, an excellent learning scenario, one of the things I learned about it was that for Iran, it'd be very, very odd for them to start something with Hezbollah right now when they're trying to jigger approval for their nuclear program because they want the two in conjunction. And here they've laid it out in a way that this scenario actually provided the opportunity for a decapitating strike on Hezbollah before the Iranians could do anything. So, interesting strategic situation. The United States remains a staunch, firm, unshakable supporter of Israel. We played this in the scenario, but it's true in real life. We're bound together by not only um, the, the most solemn pledges of top leadership, but also by culture, affinity, commitment, and just America's love for Israel. So that's not going to change, and don't ever think it will. It's there, it's real, but we have to handle ourselves the right way so that we can bring the peace and stability and economic growth in this region that we all strive for. And uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank my team here, uh, the ambassador and, and the others who were with me and helped me represent the American perspective. Great learning experience for us, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.